Welcome to the course Introduction to Urban Planning. In today's session, we will continue with our exploration on public health and cities. La in the last session, we saw World Health Organization report and then we looked at certain cases from London, Paris and New York and we saw how the responses vary with time, place and people. Today we will see Indian cases, particularly Mumbai and Surat. Accordingly, we will cover Bombay Plague which happened during 1896-1897. We will review the conditions and responses at that time and look at initiation of planning legislation in the country and the urban reforms that took place. Then we will look at Surat Plague of 1994 and and also look at the re relevant urban reforms that were taken to control and keep the city healthy and safe thereafter. The expected learning outcomes after completion of this session, you should be able to compare the Indian context with global changes with the help of Bombay and Surat plague case studies. You should be able to review our journey as a country in bringing changes in the health conditions of our cities through urban reforms, you should be able to list key events, key interventions and review them with our own context temporarily. Like we started seeing that health is just not the matter of disease, infrastructure, finances, human resource, the staff and the associated number with it. Rather also it reflects our housing condition, hygiene, socio-economic divide, power, legislation, vulnerability, emotions, trauma, affordability, law and order, governance, leadership and attitude. We will look at the Bombay plague which happened during 1896-1897. We will look at it because it was transformative time for us. Experience during this time was key in our planning and health history for the development of planning legislation and many urban planning interventions regarding health in our country. The publication by the Science Wire in the Health History suggests that Bombay Plague reached India via naval trade routes in September 1896. It was the bubonic plague which we touched upon in our previous class. It was suggested to be originated in the Chinese mainland during the early 19th century, the ruling Quang dynasty at that time was by some account reluctant to quarantine patients since it meant separating them from their families and doing so conflict with their ethical teaching. The plague spread across the Chinese mainland for almost a century and eventually spread southeast reaching the port cities by 1894 and killing more than 70,000 people on its way. You may see how cities have been always vulnerable on account of its attribute of connectivity. We had seen from Condren's writing that how people reacted to epidemic ranged widely according to the time, place and the social condition of those who had to live through them. Professor Dosal in her writing published 1999 tells that as a result of death and the exodus of the panic stricken people were just moving out of the city, the city's population of more than 8 lakhs was reduced to half more than 5 lakhs of the city's inhabitant including approximately 20 to 30 percent of its mill workers fled the city crippling Bombay's commercial and industrial activities including the cotton mill. So we may recollect that we saw in case of yellow fever in Philadelphia in 1793 the well to do left at the first threat of it. Here we see that the mill workers fled the city and it disturbed the commercial and the industrial activities. The city's terrible housing conditions aided the spread of the disease. The death rate in working class neighborhoods climbed 
as high as 12.5 percent. So we see high death rate and again affecting the working class the most. There was rapid decline in trade and industry and resulted in serious dislocation of life in the city because of uh, there was international restriction on goods from Bombay port, the closure of cotton mills and other manufacturing establishments. The city had to pay a heavy price for civic neglect. So we see how it impacted the economy and harshly damaged the quality of life for the people. And because of that, it also impacted the industrialist and civic bodies because uh, it was difficult to get people to work for them. Bombay's mill owners encountered violent difficulties recruiting the industrial laborers from 1897 to 1899 as many workers had fled the city. So we see it also influenced the labor market. You may connect it with the current situation also what you had witnessed in the past one year. For the next two decades, Bombay's mill owners regularly discussed the conditions of mill workers' housing, which led some mill owners such as CN Vadia to assert that good housing is not only desirable but absolutely necessary to future of the industry. So we see here how providing housing to the working class became important. The plague epidemic was attributed to unhygienic conditions prevailing in Bombay. We see hygiene became an important public concern. It compelled the Bombay government, the Bombay Municipal Corporation as well as public minded citizens to look closely into civic matters such as cleaning of streets, disposal of sewerage, inadequate and poorly ventilated housing and modes of transport. The municipality had to take actions to ensure these environments. As per Dossal's publication, on 6th October 1896, Municipal Commissioner of Bombay City, P.C. Snow, ordered all persons suspected to have the plague to be removed to the hospitals and segregated from the rest of the population. Segregation was believed to be the most effective way of containing the epidemic. The Epidemic Diseases Act of March 1897 gave additional powers to the civic authorities to detain and segregate plague suspects, inspect, disinfect, evacuate and even demolish dwellings suspected of being contaminated. So we see how the act came in and additional powers were given to the civic bodies and the decisions were tough ones. Fairs and pilgrimages were stopped and road and rail travelers detained for inspection. In short, government officials were empowered to act decisively and contain the disease. We see different actions which were taken which also involved power distribution and political willingness. Professor Dosal documents that while some left the city, others tried to hide family members and friends from being detected by the plague inspection committees. Municipal vans which carried patients to the Arthur Road Hospital at Baikula were often stored by persons who feared being taken to hospitals. It was seen as an act which defiled and caused the loss of caste status and even death. There were a lot of protests to protest against the high handedness of civic officials, a number of hartals or strikes were called by fruit and vegetable vendors. Important among the protests were those of mill workers who in late October 1896 protested at the forcible carrying away of two women mill workers from the Jacob Sassoon mill because they were suspected of having contracted the plague. The workers threatened to destroy the hospital and free the patients who they said were victims not of the plague but of high handedness of the plague inspection committee. 
the police had to be called in to restore order. You can see the emotional stress, the class struggle, different vulnerability and the challenges the urban governance was expected to handle. So as per the record, we see a more serious threat came from Julahas or the weavers from North India. They resented the manner in which a house search team led by G. R. Gilder, an officer in plague department, had entered a Julaha home and suspecting a 20-year-old girl to plague ordered physical examination and removal to hospital, which led to altercation and riots. The police opened the fire, but rioting which had begun in the Belasas Road spread to nearby Duncan Road, Babula Tank, Grant Road and Parel. It also spread to Foraz and Falkland Roads and on the Bandra where butchers refused to supply meat. So serious was the threat to law and order that the Bombay government ordered the military, naval and volunteer forces to supplement the efforts of the police force. 247 men were arrested for rioting of whom 205 were sentenced to various terms of imprisonment while others was discharged for the want of identification. Other group also resisted the plague committee's methods. On 6th April 1897, about 3,000 Khatravalas and Hummels at the Cotton Green at Kulaba struck work, protesting against inspection and forcible entries into their homes. Their strike affected the movement of cotton stocks and impacted adversely the cotton trade. In this case, cotton merchants took the initiative and called the strikers back to work, assuring them that though house inspections would continue forcible, hospitalization would not. The authorities feared that municipal workers such as scavengers, sweepers and drivers of municipal vans would join the general exodus and they would also leave the city. This would cause the epidemic to assume even more calamitous proportions with no one left to remove the garbage, clean the sewers, remove the sick to hospitals or carry the dead to the graveyards. To prevent the nightmare from worsening, health officer declared municipal workers to be providers of essential services and prohibited them from leaving their workplace. Railway and port authorities were to refuse them tickets to travel. If necessary, they were to be detained by force. The city already faced a shortage of cooks, tailors, barbers, coolies and mill workers, working people vital to continue of the basic everyday economic. You see how critical was the service of, uh, of these people that it affected the health and economic status and the working of the city in totality. Kidambi writes that colonial authorities grew increasingly concerned about the public health posed by the filthy housing condition of the city's labor classes. The inadequate sanitary condition in the dwellings of the inhabited by the poor were perceived as the primary cause for the spread of epidemic in the city. Finding solution to the problems of overcrowding and insanitary housing became a matter of critical importance if Bombay as a city had to fulfill its royal agenda. One of the major consequences, this one is important for us to relate, uh, of concern was formation of the City Improvement Trust in 1898 with the express intention of clearing the city of its insanitary areas and mitigating the problems caused by the terrible living condition of the poor. Dossel writes that to deal with the crisis caused by the bubonic plague, a supra-municipal body known as Bombay City Improvement Trust was established on 9th November 1898. During the first decade of its existence, the BCIT undertook 33 projects. In this image, we can see the picture of 
the office building of BCIT. As per the publication in the planning perspective in 2013, Bombay City Improvement Trust eventually inspired the establishment of similar trust in other Indian cities, initially in Kolkata in 1911, then also notably in Kanpur in 1919, Lahore in 1936 and Delhi in 1937. So we see the origin of planning legislation in Indian context. Kidambi writes that these problems were sought to be dealt with an ambitious scheme that would reorder the Bombay built environment. The Bombay Improvement Trust was entrusted with the work of making new streets, opening out the crowded locality, reclaiming land from the sea to provide room for expansion of the city and construction of the sanitary dwelling for the poor. In this image, you can see how streets were reorganized and how the crowded locality were opened up. Trust was not only supposed to carry these works urgently, but also to provide for future development of the city to enhance its image as a center of imperial political and commercial power. The intervention by the state in the sphere of urban development through creation of a special agency devoted solely to civic infrastructure was the first attempt of its kind in colonial India. Dossal narrated in her writing, agenda was the decongestion of overcrowded parts of Indian town, the better ventilation and cleaning up of the unsanitary areas as well as provision of additional housing for the poor and the police force. Additional housing and the police force show growing fear of lawlessness on the part of Bombay's authority. So you, you, the way you heard before what kind of situation was there, so you see how that the police force also came in here. The spread of nationalism and extremist politics in the country coupled with increasing number of industrial strikes since 1890 had raised doubt about the state's ability to deal with the political strife. Mass mobilization in politics had come to stay. Experience of dealing with plague victims too had made officials more sensitive to the class divisions. Conflicts which had earlier been seen in terms of religious, ethnic, communitarian divides were increasingly being seen in class term. Financial constraints and the decision to turn to the government of India for aid led to review in 1907 and 8 of the work done by the Improvement Trust over a period of decades. So you also see the financial problems coming in. All efforts were praised by the trust but there was need for comprehensive, harmonious and futuristic plan for development of Bombay town and island and this need was also realized at this time. Highlighted by Professor Dosal, we see that shortage of housing had meant increase in rents and making the Mumbai city more expensive to live in than London middle and poorer class of person were reduced to great straits in their endeavor to house themselves at a reasonable rates within reach of their daily objectives. So you see the middle class and the poor were being drifted away and away from the city. Health and the aligned interventions also created problems of affordability of housing. Quoting from Professor Dosal's writing, the poor had to pay anything from rupees 3.5 to rupees 5 for a small apartment per month. The monthly salary of a dock or a mill worker in this period was about rupees 20 per month. Shortage of housing had meant that rent had risen considerably and threatened, if unchecked, to make Bombay a more expensive city to live in than London. In this image, you can see the chawls built by Bombay Improvement Trust in early 1920. Very few were built to rehouse the people displaced by redevelopment and rents were unaffordable by the great majority. The environment was of crisis management. There was need for long-term planning to meet the need of the city. There was urgent need of housing required not only for the 
satyas and industrialists of Bombay, but also for the middle classes and the poor and also there was need for improved transport. There was concern for the class in the plans put forward by the government. If we reflect upon what we saw in history segment also, these kind of issues were raised. No longer could government ignore the quality of life of the poor as the neglect could be life threatening for all. Large numbers of industrial workers in India leading industrial city could simply not be ignored. Forums representing their interest were still tenuous for it was the interest of colonial government, of landlords, businessmen and industrialists which were protected by bodies such as municipal corporation, the city improvement trust, the mill owners association, the railway boards and the chamber of commerce. The focus in 1907-8 was to plan in a coordinated manner taking into account the needs of the city for the next 20 years. So, you can see how the long term planning things are coming into picture here. In this period reclamation of additional land from the sea was seen as one solution. Proposals for reclamation land at the bay back proposed earlier in 1860s were once again taken up for consideration. Improved transport especially suburban railway lines could enable large number of middle and lower class of persons to shift their residence to the Mahim woods or even further north into the neighborhood island of Salsete. This would reduce congestion in the city itself and make available housing at lower rates and in better and healthier surroundings. Important in Governor's Clark's further plan for Bombay was the need to keep the island divided into natural areas. A further development would take place according to class and occupation and the divisions sought as far as possible be localized that is remain separate. Harmonious planning was not about integration of class and occupational groups, but rather a conscious effort to keep them distant and separate in clearly identifiable localities. Distance would protect them from each other. So, we see how health is a complex and interlinked aspect. It varies with community, place, economy and politics. It reflects our state as well as impact our housing, socioeconomic condition and questions the power legislation, raises concern of vulnerability, emotions, trauma, affordability, law and order and governance. We see that the working class was impacted the most and at the same time their services was also crucial to keep the city functioning. So, we saw formation of CIT and spatial planning, sanitation, transportation and housing interventions. However, the working class was placed and segregated at a distance place in the new plan, acknowledging addressing classes and occupational divide in the plan was yet to happen. Now, let us look at the other case study, Surat. We will read through the narratives of another case plague that happened in Surat in aftermath of floods in 1994. Through this particular case we learn about yet another aspect amidst politics, financial problems, poor management, ineffective planning, behavioral aspect and numerous other shortcomings, the side of governance and managerial expertise and urban reforms in such crisis. Surat was prone to filariasis in 1950s, introduction of underground drainage in 1958 reduced the transmission of the disease. The humid climate of Surat is conducive for Kalax mosquito breeding. Even with a drop in the density of Kalax mosquito, the transmission of disease continued for which the Surat Municipal Corporation implemented the national Phalaresis control program. The year 1988-93 saw the worst incidence of malaria in Surat. 
At that time, more than 50,000 to 52,000 positive cases of malaria occurred in a year, when the population was only around 14 lakhs. Thus, you can see how high the incidences were. There was no separate malaria control department established in the municipal corporation till 1985 when it was funded by government of India. We also see that it took nearly five years to sensitize lawmaker that there is a need for a department devoted to malaria control. This led to malaria control department staffed by primary health workers. At present, this function is a full-fledged vector-borne disease control department and has an entomologist. The development and strengthening of the health and vector bone disease department of Surat Municipal Corporation enhanced the capacity of Surat Municipal Corporation to anticipate disease outbreaks and its readiness to deal with it. Scholars record that Surat used to suffer from several seasonal epidemics in addition to malaria like with typhoid, jaundice, gastroenteritis and influenza before plague. Waterborne diseases had the highest reported cases. The health department of Surat Municipal Corporation had a separate wing for epidemic control, filariasis and malaria control, leprosy control, vaccination and so on. However, the functioning of health department could not cope during the plague period. So the plague which we are talking about, the health department could not cope up with that. In the Pre-plague days, CMC's health infrastructure was inadequate and also suffered from previous limitations like inadequate medical and paramedical personnel, irregular supply of medicines and so on. Prior to the plague episode, there were wide open drains, pollution of groundwater sources, crowded living in industrial areas, open piles of rotting garbage, pools of overflowing sewage and absence of latrines. All these contributed to turning of Silk City to a sick city. Subsequent to the disaster, the attitude of the citizens changed and they carefully tried to improve their living conditions. Jariwala and co-authors highlight the need for transparency, social accountability and fair governance during such crisis. The scholars have noted that institutional reforms and their impact on access and coverage of service delivery to the citizen in the city is critical. Studies indicate that in case of Surat, the SMC underwent remarkable changes in terms of building its capacity in the aftermath of the plague. System reforms such as decentralized decision making, accountability and transparency evolved due to the leadership of then city commissioner in 1995-96. Reforming intra-organization process such as breakdown of silos, empowering deputy and assistant commissioner and insisting that officers learn from the field constituted a major part of restructuring. Due to these reforms, interagency's coordination was strengthened within the system. So we see how strong leadership, change in the structure of decision making, empowering people, intergovernmental coordination and field presence of the urban authority was instrumental in controlling and improving the situation. Scholars also report that after the plague, the health indicators improved due to the strengthening of health infrastructure, revival of work ethics among health workers, meticulously planned disease monitoring system and extensive sanitation drive. In 1991, there were six urban health centers which increased to um, nearly 47 urban health centers by now. Likewise, the health department also strengthened its vector-borne disease control department, water supply department to curb the waterborne disease and carry out regular water testing. So we see how the health infrastructure improvement was focused and also the required work for it was targeted and in addition the monitoring system was also developed and drive mode was adopted which helped in controlling and improving the situation of the city in such a crisis. 
We see that transformation of governance in SMC involves three building blocks, namely capacity development and system level reforms, attitudinal change, new initiatives and innovations. As the capacity development, as part of the capacity development, meaning training the people along with an enabling environment, created supporting environment which played mutually reinforcing role in the institution reform in the city. The various administrative strategies adopted by the CMC were decentralization of power, authority and accountability, collective decision making, regular monitoring and surveillance, setting up of grievance readdressal system, coordination with elected representatives, maintaining strict discipline and work culture, demolition of illegal constructions and strengthening municipal income and expenditure. Decentralized governance with the city system, mandatory field visit, top official had to spend minimum 5 hours every day in the field as to expose them to the hardship of the field work and make them more considerate and humane. The concept was named as AC to DC which meant from air conditioning environment to the daily chores. Surat Municipal Commissioner Mr. S. R. Rao appointed on 3rd May 1995 had taken major initiative in city cleanliness, system reforms, road widening, demolition of illegal constructions and so on. The result brought by then leadership of Rao, uh, we see that uh, there was increase in sanitation coverage from 63 to 96 percent, increase in daily garbage collection from 98 percent of the garbage collection and it achieved 97 percent of tax areas recoveries. Further we see there was a lot of uh, initiation of motivating community to undertake specific behavior patterns. So, we did talk about there is a concern of attitude related to hygiene proved to be effective in containing outbreaks of infectious disease. Initiatives such as private sector involvement, management improvement, better financial management, financial and taxation reform, resource planning and mobilization process improvement such as deployment of e-governance model in the select services, improved accountability like introduction of citizen charter and it received award for country's best readdressal system. And Surat received award for countries. Surat received award for country's best readdressal system. The structure of SMC was amended from a rigid vertical hierarchy to a more interactive horizontal structure. They also created posts for specific public health responsibilities and regular monitoring. Now, Surat has one of the most comprehensive and effective urban health system that integrate national and state level health programs with local initiatives. You can see initiatives related to sexually transmitted disease, STD, AIDS, reproductive and child health and integrated child disease surveillance program. You also see prevention of parent to child transmission, PPTCT which are upgraded maternity home. You also find urban health centers were converted to integrated counseling and testing centers. The project won the award for excellence in the year 2008-9 for sexually transmitted infection clinics as well as award for specific initiatives for HIV counseling and testing in STI clinics. A public health professional stated that SMC had established STD clinics with a counselor in every urban health center and also established HIV testing centers. SMC has invested in disease surveillance system of the city. SMC is the only corporation that funds the vector bone disease control department from its own budget. SMC has adopted the goal to establish one urban health center per 1 lakh population. All these urban health centers have primary health care delivery system and carry out preventive and curative activities. All the national health programs like reproductive and child health program 
vector bone disease control, revised national tuberculosis control program, mass drug administration, school health checkups and so on are implemented through urban health centers. We also see design prototypes has been prepared for urban health centers to standardize the facilities and to reduce the cost and time in the process. Public health mapping exercise commenced in 1995 for plotting the health related data. Parameters included quality of drinking water, leakage of water pipes and occurrence of major disease. For documentation and mapping purposes, SMC had developed a network of over 2000 surveillance center that included municipal hospitals, urban health centers, major hospitals and private medical practitioner. This exercise helped the city officials to predict the trend as well as focal point of epidemics in the city. Post plague rapid cleaning was undertaken by SMC, a major drive was launched by slum improvement and solid waste management in the city. Micro level planning was introduced for uniform distribution of resources, manpower, machinery and finances. The sanitary activities were contracted out to private agencies. Privatization initiatives included hiring of private vehicles with drivers for garbage collection, cleaning of roads, employing private sweepers for transporting municipal refuse from collection point to disposal points. Uh, uh, the projects were done under JNNRUM. The biomedical waste management project was started in 2003 and the door to door garbage collection was commissioned in 2005. This has resulted in improved service delivery at the local level and has improved accountability. The SMC and the private practitioners entered into the public private partnership in 1995 after the plague. Such partnership also helped in managing the healthcare delivery system of the city. The partnership was need based and a long time one. Public private partnership was developed even for data management and health surveillance system. Now it has increased to include more private practitioner impaneled with SMC. As per the publication, the major hospitals partnered with civil hospitals, SMI MER hospital and Muscati hospital for this initiative. 11 trust hospitals were also part of the system of data sharing. They constituted a part of the passive disease surveillance system. The partnership between SMC and private doctors evolved with time. We also see e-governance reforms. SMC has been applying information technology system and application in past years for improving operational efficiency and increasing ease of interaction with the citizen. There are cities civic centers, M governance, information kiosk, SMC helpline and public health engineering MIS system. M governance initiative includes the launch and use of smartphone apps and getting grievances through WhatsApp. We also see that a lot of initiatives were taken for attitudinal change. The transformation of the city from the filthiest city to the cleanest city within the span of 18 months at that time was largely attributed to both SMC and efforts of the community. People also realized that they could not leave the city at the mercy of God or civic authorities. This attitudinal shift inculcated in them a sense of belongingness and pride for the city along with a concern for cleanliness. Rao made efforts to involve local citizens and NGOs to launch cleaning campaign and development of the city. Because of his involvement, health surveillance system was strengthened and procedures for planning infrastructure facilities, particularly sewage and water expedited. The first thing that Rao did was invigorating the administration. He initiated certain measures to make the administration effective such as motivating the staff, structural changes in administration and decision making process. The staff has been added at all levels in the sanitary department varying from 19 percent to 114 percent. The number of chief sanitary inspectors had increased from 7 to 15 and the Safai uh, Karamchari, the sweeper increased from 3,000 more than 3,000 to nearly 4,397 from 1995 to 1996. In every ward there 
were 50 or more sweepers. Each one of them is expected, each one of them was expected to cover approximately 35,000 square feet area. Their work was supervised by Mukadam supervisor, SSIs and SIs. To facilitate the work of the officer, most of the senior officers were provided vehicle fitted with high frequency wireless set when they move in the field. When they moved in the field, they were supposed to pass on information to the concerned zoner commissioner as well as concerned officer to take a quick action on complaint. If they find anything wrong, they would visit the nearest ward office and instruct the SI who was the head of the ward or sub inspector to attend to the problem. In order to avoid red tape and delay, direct communication between the departments and zone have been encountered. In past, as and when an officer of one zone wanted a particular machine, truck or something else from the other zone, he had to write to the concerned zonal officer with request. The latter would supply the material and so on, so it used to take time. Now one zonal officer can directly talk on phone to other zonal officer or other officer and can procure the machine or get work done at the earliest. The commissioner advised that the order demand on the telephone should be executed without delay. Though watertight division among the departments have been reduced, we each officer from the zonal officer to Mukadim is made solely responsible for a particular area and related work, hence nobody could shrink responsibility. The SMC began paving the internal roads of slum with quota stones so as to facilitate cleaning. By 1997, 75% of the slums were paved with rough quota stones. The SMC launched a program of construction of toilet in slums in early 1995. By the end of 1996, 40 toilets complexes were constructed through uh, support of NGOs, Sulabha and Pariyavaran. They functioned on the basis of pay and use principle. The women and children under 12 years were allowed to use it without payment, whereas male had to pay rupees 15 per month and 50 pasa per use and so on. Intervention also included road widening and demolition of unauthorized construction. There were negative feedback for the poor. 24 slums and around 3,200 dwellings have also fallen victim to the construction of the new Surat. They have been removed from their settlement and as they were obstacles to the widening of the roads. This is not the first time that the slums have were removed. So on the whole, the situation of Surat, except for the victims, were happy with all that had happened in the last one and a half years. They made the city beautiful. So we see health is one of the major concern of urban planning and is much influenced by the state of the city from its environment. Housing, infrastructure, state, socioeconomic status, affordability, its attitudes, its finances, governance, leadership, and the support of each worker working for the city and its people, including the one cleaning the street, are important. Summarizing, we saw today Bombay Plague of 1896-1897, we heard the narratives of the socio-economic situation and the complex problem we faced. We looked at Bombay City Improvement Trust and the projects done by them. Range of problems, we were able to solve certain level of problem, but then still we were unable to understand the new kind of problems we were creating. But you can see how the two are interconnected. They might cause the health issues and the uh, urban planning may also help you to resolve the health issue. We saw the case of Surat 1994, we reviewed the conditions and the urban reforms to control and keep the city healthy and safe thereafter. We saw that how our understanding developed from just the spatial planning to the details of urban reforms, the governance and leadership and how the structure has to be. Following are the references taken for this particular section. Uh, this, uh, these uh, examples, case examples have been very limited as per the scope and the time of the uh, session. You may uh, find other suggested readings here. If you want to explore more, you can go through them as well as we have uh, enlisted the um, watch, the movies and other videos documentary which you can wa watch here. 
Please feel free to ask questions, let us know about any concerns you have, do share your opinions, experiences and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring cities and urban planning. Thank you.